So, you know, the key ideas, if they're statements, they're, they're statements to be, if you like, almost slightly contested. They're almost like hypo hypotheses. So we need that, some sense of that wider ethos. And I think, thanks to, largely to Eleanor Rawling, but also the organisations that were involved in the, in the DfE subject content, if you go back to the DfE subject content, which have been the, if you like, the requirements, the specification which the awarding organisations have all had to, um, had to meet, you'll see those six points about what ought to be assessed in fieldwork. And I think it's really helpful to, ha to have that in, in our minds and, and think about which of those controlled assessment has perhaps done well and where it's been weaker. And, and I think we only need to go as far as number one to say, well, actually, what kinds of questions could be investigated through fieldwork? And I think many teachers might be sitting there thinking, well, well no. I, I do all of that. I, I choose the topic or I choose the focus. I decide the area. I set up all the inquiry. Students go out and, and they, they do this. They do, they do what I ask them to do because the awarding organisation sets the title. Um, it, it doesn't quite prescribe what we should do, but it, it certainly puts parameters around the task to make it, make it doable for this age group. So I think you don't need to go very far, just past that first bullet point to think, actually, if we're going to really improve field work, we ought to be doing something about that, about maybe getting students to understand the sorts of questions. And I think Educast have come up with a very novel way, a very different way of, of, of approaching field work, which, you know, hold on, I'll get to it. Um, when we look at point two, the range of techniques and methods, again, sometimes they appreciate that if you've done that for them, but I don't come across many teachers, I won't say none, because there's, a, there's a, an army of teachers out there who do get students to you know, go and do their own thing in terms of data collection. But I have to tell you, you know, if you are one of those teachers, it is far from universal. And I think if you do get your students collecting data somewhat creatively, maybe using their own apps on their own smartphones and so on, you're in a minority. Um, however much we might praise that, and I, personally I would praise that, and I know that Andy praises that. I'm, I'm on secure ground from saying that you know, that would be as close to Educast policy, I think, as you know, to encourage teachers to do that and generate that sense of personal engagement as, as, as anything you could, you, could, you could ever say. When you look at points three and four, I think that's what controlled assessment's done pretty well. But often it's been done in a kind of task-led way. I don't know that it's generated out of students saying, Look, let me see if I can find out if that river went faster or slower. It's usually, miss or sir, how have I got to present these again? Oh, scatter graphs, okay, right. And they routinely turn out a scatter graph. And, and that's, the, if you like, the minimalist um, ele element of it. As a result of which, you sometimes get, and the second word they're critical, point five, evidenced conclusions. Okay, one piece of field work I saw last year. Uh, my key question is to see whether my local town conforms to the idea of a clone town. And the student went out dutifully, did everything, did questionnaires, land use maps, we saw all the charity shops and that sort of thing. There were several ways. The teacher really set it up well. Actually, this really wasn't a clone town. There were certain bits of it that were a bit of a clone town with its charity shops in the, in the town centre and so on, but it really wasn't. So the student had set up all these methodologies, analysed it, and you thought, great, the student's really well. And then at the end, yep, my town's a clone town. As though the evidence that they collected meant nothing. As though they thought that really perhaps they ought not to be challenging the question that the teacher had set up for them. Yeah, you don't dare do that. So evidence conclusions, that, 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 that phrase there is particularly important. When it gets to reflecting critically, actually students often up their game again towards the end of their pieces of work. They do sometimes say, well, you, you, you do get the kind of, well, it rained. You know, that's, if you like, the one mark out of six that might sort of take them on the way down to, you know, onto a sort of grade D or E. But, uh, but you do get the students who begin to think, well, you know, we could have done this differently or if it had been another kind of river, we might have found different results, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That, that's not done badly. But it's a pretty, what I'm saying with all those, those stages there, one to six, it's a pretty bumpy process at the moment. And I think if we could smooth that, if we could raise the game, perhaps of the points that maybe we don't do quite so well at the moment, it will really help. And so, I know one teacher who, said, who, who talks about doing, doing inquiry, well, she says, we do the inquiry in the summer term when everybody, in, in, in year 10, when everybody's off on exams. 
as though the inquiry is the only time when inquiry-based learning actually, actually happens. It's, it's a bolt-on, if you like. Margaret Roberts, if, if I had a challenge two years ago, see if I could get the word Olympics and also the phrase Margaret Roberts into, into any lecture I ever gave at the GA. Well, there's tick number one. Margaret Roberts, who, who you know, does stand on a pedestal as, as far as I'm concerned. Her work on inquiry says fundamentally, in some way, you've got to start from students' own experiences, own understanding of concepts, of places, before you can really take them on. If you just walk in with a kind of, if you like, a, a list of content in, in your mind to, to teach them, then, then perhaps we're seeing them rather as sort of empty vessels to be filled, rather than people who are kind of going to make their own sense of an engagement with, with, with ideas. So her work is all about how, how we get students to engage with questions or perceptions. And I think the story I've just told you about the school doing the three river sample points, that, that kind of experience I think almost undermines that because the teacher sets it off as a series of tasks. And, and I think if you want the final nail in the, in the coffin in that kind of experience, and it's more widespread I think than we might want to admit, it's that kind of, it is that kind of measures of progress that many teachers feel forced into providing, to, that it's more important to fill in the progress measures form for SLT at the end of every half term to demonstrate that everybody's on track than it is to really engage with thinking about serious, serious inquiry. So I think that when that happens, um, this is another diagram, again, that Andy put together for, for a WJEC fieldwork uh, session last year. If you look, we, that cycle of inquiry, and it may be fieldwork, it may be our classroom lessons, where we start with a question and we start to plan, and based on, on that plan and based on that question, we start to think about, well, what kind of data should we collect and how should we observe or collect it, and so on, that takes us through the presentation and analysis to the application of ideas to, we review then the question again, you know, it's, it's as though that whole, if you like, five-stage cycle has been forgotten about. And actually, those two green circles there, they become a series of tasks. And, and one of the worst things about controlled assessment has been that for many students, particularly in schools where there's the solo geography teacher and they don't get the chance to take students out for fieldwork key stage three, it becomes the single opportunity in fieldwork that students have to get it right. It's not as though there's a kind of pilot that they can sort of play around with. And I do know a few schools now, particularly in those schools who, who are doing three-year GCSEs, where they feel, actually, that gives us a bit more time and maybe we'll set up a kind of dummy run field work in year nine just to help students get, in, get to engage with the, the whole outdoor environment and how we, how we collect information. And that begins to open up and get away from that ra rather sort of task-led um, procedure. And, and Margaret Roberts' work... Is, is really based around three models of inquiry. Uh, and, and there are times, I, I don't mean in any way to undermine these, I just think it's, it's a shame that some of them take place in the outdoor environment. I, I'll start, start with the first one. You, you often find teachers will have closed tasks. So you might want students to get away from that awful phrase, M-E-D-C, L-E-D-C, to stop them thinking about there's this kind of bipolar division, countries are either there or there. And you might want students to think about development as a spectrum between more and less developed or high income, low income and so on. So you might set up an activity of, say, students analysing data from 10 countries and you've selected the countries and you've chosen them purely on the basis of you know that you'll get a spectrum rather than a classification. So if you like, you know the end idea. And lots of your lessons may be like that, but you've got students engaged with processing data, thinking about data, and coming to a conclusion. It's a closed task, but it's still a valid inquiry. It's still a perfectly noble thing to, thing to do, because you're under pressure, you've got a GCSE spec to teach, and you, you want to get through it. So, so that's fine. You, know, you, you, you don't maybe sort of question the data, whose data they are, when they were collected, and so on. You present them as authoritative evidence, but you're happy with that because you want the students to learn something. Now, that's fine, but if you take that out into the field and you've got the three points along the rivers model again, I, I think we're kind of missing a, missing a trick. And those are where I think some of the weak examples, where there are weaknesses in the controlled assessment process, that's where it tends to come. And I think you find actually that the better, or perhaps even the best controlled assessments come from the middle column where you have a framed inquiry, where the teacher slackens off a little bit. You know, that sort of control sets up most of the inquiry data collection mechanisms, but says, look, 
If you're looking at quality of life in urban environments and you're trying to compare two areas, what I'd like you to do to prepare yourselves for that, I want to see if you can find any apps that might help you. And you might give the students one or two ideas. I mean, you might have something like Decibel Tenth, a free app which becomes your free decibel meter. I recorded it on the Flybe flight from Newquay to Manchester yesterday, and it's like being inside a food processor when you're on a Flybe flight, because it's 93 decibels. <laughs> There we are, that was my little, my little inquiry. But you know, students can do that kind of thing, and one group of students may be recording de uh, decibel meters, and other, others may be using secondary evidence about air quality, you know, quite rich if you're looking at air quality in the UK today, uh, about uh, air quality in different uh, urban areas. And so when, again, taking it to the end point, the awarding organisation, when they're moderating and validating you know, your teacher marks, they're looking at pieces of work and actually say, God, these A stars are fantastic. You know, these C's are much better than the D's, E's and F's because they've been out and they've done a little bit of their own data collection. So you see those kinds of places where students have made the choices about what sort of data they'd like to use. Um, sometimes it's quite easy to set up. You might have, say, a 10-point environmental quality process of, say, you might have decided six indicators and you leave the other four blank and students have to think up, well, what sort of... Uh, environmental quality might we use. So it, it, it's not rocket science, it doesn't have to be difficult, but it does get students thinking. And so those are the sorts of things where we've seen better examples from, from controlled assessment. Now, very, very few examples, I haven't seen one yet, I mean, I'll be absolutely you know, brutally honest with you, in nine years, in six years rather, since 2009, I haven't seen any examples of independent inquiry, and that might be just going a bit further than, than we might want GCSE to go. Though I think independent inquiry in the classroom is, is noble, probably the fact that there are constraints on the controlled assessment process mean that I think from 2016 onwards, when post-16 fieldwork comes in, and students have got to be by themselves, they've got to come up with an independent focused inquiry, then I think we may be doing them a disservice if we haven't at least begun to open doors and think about possibilities at GCSE so that we begin to slacken off the reins a little bit and say, look, there are actually a whole range of possibilities out there that we might consider.